All right, I'm going to get started. Uh, thanks very much for coming along to my session on building a games user research lab. Uh, my name is Sebastian Long. I'm the managing director of an agency named Player Research. Here's all the social things to follow me if you're so inclined. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be back here, not least to see lots of new faces. Hello, everyone, if you've, especially if you've not been to a, a games UR conference before. Uh, just a bit about me. I'm managing director. I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I'm a games user research consultant. I run a small business, uh, but a particular pleasure is having had the opportunity to design three playtesting facilities in the last uh, six years. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about today. But I have already talked about this before. Uh, the previous talk I gave in 2016 was the second playtest facility that I'd overseen uh, the construction of in Brighton in the United Kingdom. Since this talk in 2016, I've designed two more. Uh, first was a relatively minor iteration in Montreal in Canada. It was two years after this talk. And a further 18 months later, I designed a, and implemented a, a facility in Brighton in the United Kingdom that was twice the size. Uh, both labs featured improvements uh, and uh, matured the advice I gave in 2016 uh, and have reflected the years of day-to-day -day use that those facilities had, including many thousands of playtesters through the doors of those three facilities. Uh, so I'm here to update the talk I gave in 2016. Thank you for the invitation to do so. Uh, let's get started. Let's just briefly take a step back and uh, make sure we're all on the same page about what a playtest facility is for. A playtest lab is a dedicated space to welcome members of the general public to share their thoughts and actions about a video game with your team. To design that space, we need to maximize player comfort, and player safety. We need to maximize the potential for us to capture data as researchers. That's what they're there for. Uh, we do so by maximizing the throughput of players, the number of people that can be put onto these unreleased video games, and the time on game, which is you know, as a sort of ratio, how much time people are playing the game versus not playing the game whilst they're in our facility. So we need to maximize the, uh, let's say, uh, design the space to maximize these factors. With this space, we also want to minimize a few things. Minimizing spoiled feedback, which is to say data that is biased beyond repair or stolen or somehow incomplete. We also want to uh, minimize uncaptured data, which is to say we could have captured information about a player doing something, but we, didn't lack, we lacked the uh, capability to do so. And lastly, uh, I've mentioned already, stolen assets. Na naturally, the secretive nature of video games means that we want to keep these play-tested uh, assets and games secret, and the design of the facility has to uh, accommodate that as well. Now, these play-testing spaces that I've des uh, described here are sometimes a bubble inside a larger studio. They might be a dedicated meeting room. They might be... Uh, you know, a small uh, a floor or something like that. Or in our case, uh, play research as an external agency, playtesting is all we do. And so we have uh, the luxury of a whole space that's dedicated to this, and you may have the same. I'm going to show you some pictures of our playtest labs in just a second. I just want to briefly touch on the goals of our facility, which is to distinguish it from potentially not uh, an external agency. Uh, there are some things that we want uh, to get particularly right. The first of those is about versatility. Play research works on tens uh, of games every year. Uh, and so we need, uh, and those are all platforms, genres, and audiences. And so our space needs to be extraordinarily versatile. We can really be testing a VR game on a Monday uh, and a console game on a Tuesday, etc. And so versatility is at the core of what we do. The second, uh, particularly stable. Again, playtesting is our co the core of our business. We are thinking, we, we're planning to do playtests in these facilities for the next 10 years. And so stability, the stability of those facilities is imperative. Uh, and lastly, accessibility. Uh, naturally important to us all. We have uh, a diverse range of playtesters that are coming to our facility, including uh, parents and children uh, and uh, players with disabilities. We also are keen to minimize a few things too, namely staff overhead. I want to keep, frankly, the costs of running a, f a facility down. I don't think it makes sense to have unnecessary staff or costs. And secondly, complexity, uh, because complexity breeds unreliability, and unreliability breeds failure. And that's just not something uh, we have time for. 
So this talk, I'm going to try and cover four topics. The layout of rooms and footprint, the fit out and furniture, which is to say the, the walls we're putting up and the, the furniture that goes in the building, the audio visual solution, and a little bit about cleanliness and the C word, I'm sorry, COVID. I have to talk about it. All right. Let's just briefly talk about lab layout then. I'm going to take one step back and say, what rooms do we need to consider? Broadly speaking, for us at least, and maybe for you, there are two categories of research that we conduct. The first of those uh, is uh, inviting very small groups, typically between one and five people at once, uh, choosing richness of data over volume, for example, usability testing. The second category is choosing the opposite, choosing volume of people over richness, where more people is better. Tens of people, twenties of people, 30 concurrent people, the more the better, get them through the game, get the feedback and repeat. What are these people going to do in the facility? Well, they're going to briefly wait for everybody to arrive. These are members of the general public, so they're not going to arrive exactly on time, buses and trains, etc. They're going to be briefed, which is to say, I'm going to tell them why they're there. They're going to play or see something. They're potentially going to be interviewed, which is to say they're going to speak in a small group or one-on-one -on -one with some of our research team. And they are going to be analyzed, which is to say, although they aren't direct participants in it, we're going to be observing and listening and watching what they're doing. These activities may all take place in the same room in some extreme. Uh, Play Research has the luxury of designing our own facility uh, from scratch and so uh, we've chosen in many cases to have dedicated rooms for these. We've settled on the following for the last two labs. Uh, a dedicated waiting room for players to gather at the start. The players are briefed in either the waiting room or in the rooms where they will subsequently play. We have dedicated playrooms for those participants. One for the small group sessions, so imaginatively called the small lab and one for the large uh, play sessions. I'll let you do the rest. Interviews will take place in the small labs and analysis takes place in a dedicated observation room with our, any developer guests that we have and of course our research team. All right, here's some photos. What am I talking about? Uh, these are photos of our two newest labs in Montreal and in Brighton. Here's the waiting room. It's set up for social distancing in these photos. Uh, with some barriers between players, but I'm sure you can imagine a, a, dense, a more densely filled room. We can see lockers for players' equipment and so forth. A large lab typified by individual play booths where participants sit at individual computers. Uh, uh, you know, there's quite a few people in there. The small lab typified by its resemblance of a living room or a lounge. Sofas, comfortable, you know, uh, living room, like it would, one would find in, in somebody's house. And an observation room, a cinema-like observation room. In this case, I'm referring to a primary and a secondary uh, observation room. I'll come back to that shortly. All right. So we've decided what rooms we're going to have. In each case, Play Research has adopted a blank open space. We've had, we've uh, leased open plan offices. But the same principles apply, I imagine, although I haven't done it, to reusing rooms that already exist. If you've got rooms that are already put together, you're just adopting. I hope that the, this sort of thesis for how to lay out the space will apply to a, naturally to a lesser extent. In laying out these labs, I've applied the same principle, uh, the same simple process, I should say, that I talked about in 2016, which is to say I zoned them. And there are three zones that have made the most difference in the labs I've subsequently designed. So here's the floor plan of our office, in case that wasn't clear. This is uh, the 3,700 square foot uh, facility uh, in Brighton in the UK. The three zones, and uh, perhaps you'll undertake this process yourself, I hope, uh, is what needs to be close to what, what is nice, and what is quiet. With these three lenses, these three sort of zoned areas, which I'll talk through a little more, you can do a, I'll break, a lot of the, break the back of a lot of the hard work about laying out these facilities. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we work this through. When laying out our rooms, there's things that we want to be as close to those members of the general public as possible. 
namely the toilets, the entrance, the fire exits, and there's also things we want far away, which is to say secrets, secret equipment, server rooms, our non-researcher colleagues if you have any. Our entrance is here at the bottom left with the pink arrow, and so the blue area there is what I would consider zoned as being just close by to useful stuff. I should say that the toilets are down here by that green arrow as well. Our second lens uh, is niceness. Nice views out of the window, if you're lucky enough to have windows. Nice light, nice open space, nice natural features. We want to allocate the nicest areas to where the people are uh, and allocate the least nice areas to where the people aren't, which is to say storage rooms or corridors. In our facility, we're lucky enough to have light on almost three quarters of the building and a roof terrace on the bottom right, uh, which is lovely to have lunch in the sunshine, although you do have to fend off the hungry seagulls. Uh, we are right by the sea. Uh, yes, comedy. All right, uh, so the outside of the building is very nice and we've got lots of nice zones on. Uh, we're very lucky. And the last layer is perhaps self-explanatory, is about being quiet, away from the traffic, away from, uh, which is to say road traffic, road noise, uh, busy areas, any plant machinery, noisy neighbours, and these areas naturally are to be, uh, to be reserved for co-work and for observation of play. In this case, uh, as I said, those windows around the outside of the office mean that only really the centre of the office can be guaranteed to be particularly quiet. Now I might propose that when designing your own facility, if you have uh, the chance to do so, you may well layer on your own zones on top, your own lenses, reflecting on the challenges you have, maybe temperature, maybe thoroughfare, sight lines from adjacent buildings, naturally wanting to keep the secrets away from the windows, fire exit routes, fuse boxes, risers, elevator, noisy elevators. I could go on, I shan't. Hopefully this idea of zoning is, is sufficiently useful for you. With your floor plans zoned with these traits, as I say, the, the back is broken on laying out roughly what you want where. Ex uh, allocating the space to each room, experimenting with room locations uh, inside the relevant zones and shuffling different doors and corridors around to access them. I use this process to develop about half a dozen viable uh, layouts for the facility uh, in each case and then I sort of just did a bit of a battle royale about which one was better and taking some of the best uh, uh, decisions in, inside each. So here's our final layout. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on the specific layout choices we made uh, since it's incredibly specific to our facility, but hopefully this mental model of how to do it is useful for you guys in the future. Um, I'm, so I'm going to just move on to some of the ideas that you can steal that I think are liftable from, from this process. Firstly, just before I move on from this floor plan, and you know, I don't need to do any pay too much detail to it, but you can see how we've used the corridors around the lab and observation area to acoustically isolate the center of the office for observation. I think I gave this advice in 2016 as well, and it's really paid off with this slightly larger space, which is to acoustically isolate the things you want to be quiet using the, the corridors. Um, all right. Speaking of observation spaces, one of the biggest changes uh, that we made to the design I took forward from 2016 uh, was in the previous lab, we had two single purpose observation rooms. They're uh, in orange here at the top of the screen. One of those was dedicated to the small lab, one of those was dedicated to the large lab, uh, and it was absolutely not optimal. It became pretty clear within a, you know, a few months of, of the, this lab design that that was, that was not what we should have done. And the subsequent labs I've designed have not used the same uh, approach. Instead, building one dedicated observation room, one dedicated observation room, and then a number of secondary observation rooms, which are meeting rooms first and observation room second. So they're hybridized between meeting rooms that can be used for everyday purposes and an observation room for uh, playtests running concurrently with each other. Uh, okay. Um, let's move on. In fact, within the Brighton facility, which you can say, uh, see at the bottom here uh, in the text, we have actually four spaces that can be used for observation. So we've actually increased the number of viable observation spaces 
one dedicated observation room, but then three hybrid spaces, letting us potentially run uh, multiple sessions at once, uh, again, maximizing that versatility. All right, I've talk, look, talked a lot about walls. I just want to briefly uh, talk to you about doors. <laughs> um, in both Brighton and Montreal, we've got a couple of rooms with two doors. And this might sound minor, but it's actually been a huge quality of life improvement uh, on the design of the facility. By adding two entrances to the observation room in this case, it means there's rapid access. So it's the room in the center here with the two doors. Uh, there's rapid access to all the adjacent testing rooms. Uh, and that also means there's usually a door that's busy and a door that's not, which is really helpful for creeping around the office and not taking a door to the face when the researchers are busy bustling between the observation uh, and the play testing rooms. And our large lab also contains two doors, uh, both in this case entering from the same corridor. Uh, again, this is about more about traffic. We're getting a lot of people through here, a lot of thoroughfare. We've got 24 booths in our large lab in the Brighton facility, uh, which means that's a lot of people uh, it, particularly coming into this large lab room and then w needing to find their booth number and sort of stopping to get a, the lay of the land. And so having two doors breaks that uh, in half. We've also added a little bit of versatility, and I don't know if we'll need it, but uh, if we ever need to divide this large lab in two, which is to say to build two 12-person rooms, then we've already got two doors. I don't imagine the world where we need to do that, but I've, I have designed the whole large lab around that capacity if we need to do so in future, just to give more versatility to the space. All right, my second door pro tip uh, is about double doors. We already have these hybrid meeting rooms slash observation rooms, um, but the simple addition of a couple of double doors opening out into a, the office area in our case, but an open area, um, makes them suitable for small scale lectures and town halls. In fact, uh, anyone that came to our Montreal facility when we opened it in 2017, uh, I ran a small conference out of this hybrid observation space uh, for 25 people. And so just having those double doors open out into a wider space meant that I could easily set up a lecture format. And as my company grows, uh, you know, I imagine we'll use this uh, space for concurrency uh, ever more. Door pro tip number three, three door pro tips. Uh, is about, again about throughput. Um, again, the waiting room doors, getting 24 people from the waiting room into the large labs, is, you know, there's a potential for high traffic. Um, it's going to be like Oxford Street at Christmas. So adding a pair of doors uh, in and out, learning from industrial kitchens uh, that do something similar, again, yes, prevents a door to the face for anyone that's not really paying attention, uh, but moreover, uh, reduces traffic and lets people always escape even if there is a large lab. Uh, I say escape, you know what I mean, get out of the, uh, of the corridor if there's a large lab going on. No one should be escaping. Well, I don't know why I said escaping. Uh, uh, I don't know where that came from. All right. Um, yes, and it's worth mentioning that these are the only doors in the whole facility with vision panels, which is the glass, uh, glass in the door, um, because these have the highest thoroughfare. Again, that's anti-door to the face uh, tech right there, um, and it's, it's just useful. But bear in mind, that's mostly for the reduction of sight lines. We really don't want people to be able to see through doors that are closed. That's just purely a security piece. But, uh, so the whole office has been, in fact, designed so that wherever you are in the waiting room, you can't see anything going on uh, through those vision panels, uh, even if every door is open. Uh, it's also worth mentioning, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. It's worth mentioning that all of these doors include retractable sound seals. Uh, at the bottom, so that they automatically retract when the door opens. Uh, super cheap to add, if you think about it in advance. Super expensive to retrofit. So retractable sound seals, uh, very useful. All right, that's all the door pro tips I have. I'm going to go through the sizing, of this, the one on sizing. I, I feel like if I had this slide, it would have been incredibly useful. So I'm, I'm gifting it to you. We've learned all the lessons. This is the, the, uh, the scale, the scope. Uh, of the different rooms per concurrent playtester. So at maximum capacity, how many square meters are there per person? Uh, for, you know, so this in fact is the comfort, the feel of the space, the capacity of the space. Uh, and my hope is that this, these sums, these sort of uh, numbers, will radically improve your capabilities in terms of imagining the space and saying, okay, we know we want 20 playtesters in this lab. So now you know, uh, you know approximately how many square meters you need to accommodate that. So yeah, let me know if, uh, you know, if these are useful. I really, I really, really hope that they are. Um, okay. Last piece on layout, I think, 
is just a brief nod to accessibility. I mentioned that this was uh, a tenant of our particular facility. Um, and shout out to uh, Zeli, who asked about this on the Discord as well. Uh, there is, a, you should search for a document from the British government called Document M, so ominously named, Document M, which, I don't know where they get these names from, uh, but it documents in excruciating detail the nature of an accessible building, down to the height of the uh, light switches on the wall, the exact turning circle of a wheelchair that you have to accommodate. Uh, we're lucky enough in the UK that we have extremely strict building regulations uh, with accessibility in mind, and those are documented for you in uh, Document M. Uh, so give it, give it a Google. <laughs> uh, uh, and just a few more uh, just uh, stuff for accessibility. Um, I don't think this is anything, I'm just going to rattle through it quickly, I don't think it's anything uh, too imaginative, but um, desk height is just a big thing. I think you can make a lot of accommodations by having uh, raisable desks, so build those into your booths, for example, if that's, a, if that's something you can afford to do, or just think about maybe uh, having a couple of booths dedicated to uh, those accommodations. Uh, light management is really important in my view, preventing light glare and so, uh, you know, blackout blinds on everything if you can uh, and dimmer switches on, on the lights, especially where the play testers are going to be, I think is a, is a worthwhile investment. Um, and what else? Yeah, a lot of this, uh, with regards to accessibility, a lot of this is inherited from the versatility of the furniture that we want. For example, our small lab uses actually relatively inexpensive sofas and they're really light. One person can move them around so that the team can quickly swap a hot swap between a VR setup which needs the whole room and, and a, you know, whatever different kind of setup that needs the sofas back in. Uh, and that has massive accommodations also for accessibility since you could, one person can um, just uh, kick the sofas out of the way for, uh, to make a bit of extra room if it's needed. A uh, couple of more just uh, accessibility pro tips, I guess. Um, secure stowage. Um, if people are bringing uh, crutches or medical devices with them into these accessibility tests, not, not being too far away and being securely stowed is a big point. Uh, and so make sure you've got the, that stowage under consideration. Not, not for you, actually, it's for the play testers' uh, safety and security and, and psychological safety, I guess. Uh, and uh, lastly, the accessibility of a space is not, designed, uh, not defined necessarily just by its accommodation but by the information you provide about it. And so you're more likely to have a, you know, a more diverse playtest audience feel comfortable applying to your playtests and attending your space if you tell them the accommodations that are available. What is the width of the elevator, the, the, the doors of the elevator? What is your smallest hallway? Uh, and are you step free from the street? Simple information that can be pasted either on your website if you're com so comfortable doing so or simply in playtest communications. Okay, let's move on from layout of the facility on to what I've called fit out and furniture. I'm going to set the scene a little bit. What kinds of needs does a playtest lab have that just an office or a house wouldn't have? We've got rooms that look like houses and rooms that look like offices. Well, there are some. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail at all about office and co-working spaces. There's decades of research about how to design a a, a, an effective office, uh, that's great. Uh, I am going to focus instead on the small lab and the large lab, uh, the accommodations, and the, oh, sorry, the, and the observation space. So these are all like unique rooms that you won't find anywhere else. There's a lot to consider with regard to quality, uh, sorry, to trade-offs with regards to your furniture. I can't go into all of them, but I think the most important ones maybe are, are you going to spend enough money that you, something is likely to be durable? Or are you going to commit that something is disposable? For example, what is it to say this sofa is disposable? It's going to get lots of wear and tear. We should not spend much money on it and consider it disposable. Yeah, that's a choice one has to make in advance, so as not to waste money. Um, uh, which is to say, in another way, are you going to buy something cheap or good? Uh, you've got the trade-off. Uh, it's worth also mentioning this idea of like, wh what does good mean in a playtest lab? Um, comfort, naturally. We want the space to be comfortable for our playtesters. Durability is hugely important. We've got thousands uh, of bums going on the seats every year, and so you know, it needs to be durable. Uh, space saving, you know, we want to 
the minimum possible space taken up for storage. So thinking about whether or not things are, st for example, we bought very little that, c that could be stackable but isn't. Almost everything that can be stackable is stackable to get it the hell out of the way. Cleanability, I think I mentioned this in 2016, but you know, it's, it's absolutely essential to think about maybe investing a bit more money into furniture that is easy to clean, uh, especially uh, given our current context. Aesthetics, I'm going to pick up later because someone asked a Discord question about it. And uh, environmentally responsible, since huge amounts of office furniture goes straight up into landfill. So let's try and be more uh, ecologically uh, sensible. The most, um, the extreme of this example of furniture is what I'm going to focus on. And that is custom furniture. That is paying a craftsperson to build you something bespoke for the facility. Like absolute, very, very expensive potentially uh, by the nature of building something that's just yours. Uh, but obviously massive payoff if that makes life a lot easier for you. And we did commission some custom furniture, so that's what I'm going to focus on. Naturally, commissioning furniture is both complicated, uh, time intensive, uh, and has the huge risk of being just making something that's infinitely worse than what you could have bought at IKEA, right? the chance that you're going to think outthink the IKEA boffins is relatively low. So you've got to be really confident about what you're commissioning and why, and the success factors of it, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about what we've done. Both of the new facilities in Montreal and in Brighton commissioned custom play booths for the large lab. These were, in both cases, CNC fabricated by uh, local craftspeople. Uh, we had 12 and 24 respectively built. Uh, and although I've said that these were modular, uh, custom furniture has the capacity to potentially be expensive, in actual fact, when you do the sums, these were a little bit more money than just cobbling it together out of pieces from off the shelf. Uh, for reference, I th uh, they were in the order of 350 US dollars each. Caveat, that was before the before, well, it was in the before times where it, you know, materials were a little bit uh, more, more available, let's say. In, these, in this case, these custom booths represent a very substantial improvement of user experience for the playtesters. And also have, a, in my view, a radical improvement of the quality of the data we're getting from them. I'm going to talk about that. These custom booths are extremely rigid and sturdy, which was not the case when we, did, uh, we, we built our own out of you know, bits of IKEA stuff. Um, and that's great. It feels great. They're nice and sturdy. The, the, these desks are heavy. There's a lot of them uh, in, the, in packing the, uh, the room out. And so they really benefit from being sturdy and immovable in this case. They also protect fragile cables. We've designed them to uh, have cable throughs. Uh, I'm very happy to send more pictures if anyone is inclined to uh, commission their own. They've got carefully placed uh, grommets and through holes to make sure, make sure that the relatively fragile AV cables we use uh, coming up in the next section are protected from uh, you know, wandering shoes and feet and frustrated players, you know, uh, whatever they're doing. And so, yeah, a massive improvement on the user experience for the playtesters, the quality of the data, uh, which is about protecting players from seeing each other. So these are more enclosed than a desk would be and help isolate individual players from each other. I'll talk about that in just a second when I talk about the screens as well. Um, yeah, there are, there are off-the-shelf booths. They're horrendously expensive. I don't know why. They're thousands of dollars, uh, at least the ones we could source in the United Kingdom and in Montreal in Canada. Uh, so the, as I say, these represented uh, uh, certainly a, a cost saving against uh, off-the-shelf. And if I may say so myself, they look absolutely phenomenal, all together, all lined up, like all nice and clean, all lovely and white. Uh, really, really nice, really impressive. Keeping players in each of these play booths isolated from each other is essential for integrity in large lab sessions. Researchers cannot risk screen cheating, players getting spoilers by, you know, having a little creepy look over what the other players are doing. Oh, they got further than me. Or, you know, oh, they're using that super sp whatever spell or I don't know, whatever. Uh, that undermines everything. That activity would undermine everything about the data we're collecting and the integrity of information about pace, about balance, about learnability. It was just an app, it would be a disaster. So the booths themselves pr protect from that situation, and so do these. Custom retractable screens. Uh, in these case, 
these, when you order these in bulk, at least in the UK, they're custom made anyway. There's no, there's no shops keeping stock of uh, zillions of these. And so you can quite easily just phone the manufacturers and say, hey, can you make it exactly this size? And I found them extremely accommodating. So there you go. Uh, they've been measured to the exact height that allows uh, playtesters not to see each other when they're seated, but for researchers to see over the booths and see people's, tops of people's heads to make sure they're still there uh, when looking across the room, which in our case was not a standard size but needed a custom uh, height for each of these. And they are designed to retract away, as, as demonstrated by our lovely assistant. They, uh, they push away between the booths. So if we do, for example, want playtesters or staff want to use the booths or for whatever reason, they, these uh, retractable screens just tuck away nicely uh, behind the, in between the individual booths, so super convenient. So those were the two pieces of custom furniture that we uh, justified for these facilities. But we also used a lot of modular furniture. This is off the shelf, but for whatever reason built to be customizable. Uh, in our cases, in, in two, uh, one I spoke about in the previous was uh, the modular sofa. So there are lots of companies that provide individual modules that let you custom design seating. It can go around corners. Super convenient uh, for getting, you know, in our case, a very long sofa seat in, the, in our observation room uh, for attending lots of uh, developers at the same time. And new for 2020 was uh, the podiums. I'll talk about our observation experience having changed in just a sec, but we included uh, modular stages at the back of the observation rooms to lift up the observing researchers over the heads of the visiting developers who sit in front. Um, great quality of life inclusion. And these, these are ones designed for small orchestras or school plays. So they're relatively, uh, but they're basically indestructible, I think. So they're, they're, they're good value. All right. AV stuff. What, a, what is AV in a playtest lab? One of the core sources of data that we have as user researchers is video of gameplay. In an ideal world, that video is synchronized with cameras observing the player, dates and times, very useful, potentially visualizations of the player's input on controller or on PC and mouse and keyboard, etc. And just other stuff that one can composite using software like OBS or XSplit. That, uh, there's 20, in our large lab, there is 20, 24 of these signals being generated. By any measure, that's a lot of video. That's, a, that's an equivalent of a TV studio, and probably more, uh, not a small one at that. And so it's a serious amount of data being generated, and so we have to be deliberate about it. No, moreover, not just generating it, this video needs to be viewable in real time by our researchers and recorded for future posterity, all without affecting anything that the playtester sees, since they need to have lowest latency possible, the highest frame rate possible, and be uninterrupted by the fact that all this is going on behind the scenes. In 2016, I gave these, uh, what's that, six questions to ask yourself that will form the foundation of your AV solution. And I'm not going to cover this again because in my experience, these questions and this process has absolutely held up in the last seven years, despite the technological change in the interim. At the time that this was developed, 1080p, high def, 60 frames a second, was as much as one might have expected to, to run at. Now we're looking at 4K, 120 frames a second uh, on the latest consoles. Nevertheless, this remains a useful mental model to run through. Uh, and naturally, your, your own labs, games, or whatever you're testing should radically inform the AV solution that you're using. To that end, we have used uh, a cable format called SDI for all three of the labs, or I should say the two subsequent, the one that I talked about in 2016 and both subsequent labs. And it has proved to be reliable, versatile, and which I talked about in 2016. What I didn't talk about in 2016 was its comprehensibility. It's actually relatively easy to understand how this works, which is not true of some of the other technologies that are, that are alternative to this, including fiber optic and uh, one called NDI, which I'll talk about in a sec. SDI 
there, there is no consumer games console that outputs an SDI signal. This is used for TV cameras and sometimes CCTV cameras. So you have to convert to it, which is the biggest of the trade-offs. It's not expensive. They're not cheap to buy these converters. However, there are enough advantages, in my view, to using SDI that it is an absolute no-brainer, frankly. Uh, one of those advantages I've come to learn uh, is that you can make your own cables at any length, give or take. So if you need an exactly 45 centimeter long SDI cable, go and get the crimpers and the drum and make one. It takes you a few minutes once you've learned how to do it. Unbelievable advantage. Uh, try doing that with an HDMI cable. Absolutely not possible. In the years since my last talk, new Ethernet cable based solutions have matured, particularly one called NDI by a company called NewTek. It is an open source, uh, is it open source? It's certainly a freely available format, which is to say any company can use it. It does benefit from the cheapness of Ethernet cables, which are everywhere and may already be installed in your offices. Uh, but at the time of recording, uh, that tech remains prohibitively expensive, prohibitively complicated, and I, here on the grapevine, uh, suspiciously flaky, so as not to be reliable, noting our objective of extreme reliability and stability for our facilities. Maybe most importantly, NDI lacks the ecosystem of boxes that do cool stuff to the video signal, that, uh, that, that makes our playtest lab uh, life so much easier. If I need to extract the audio from something, it's, it's absolutely um, incredibly easy to do that. Um, all right, oh, I have been advancing, sorry. Uh, and I, I may have mentioned this in 2016, but I'm saying it again, and I will say it as many times as is necessary for uh, it to sink in. If it is possible to eliminate a Windows machine from anything you want to do in your playtest facility, you should definitely do it. If there, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm sure there's Microsoft people here. I, I'm sorry. Um, but if there is a box, even a very expensive box that will do what you want, just buy it. It is never a good idea to stick a Windows machine in your pipe, except for the one that the player is playing on. I, strong, I, can't, I really cannot recommend this enough just to ditch uh, software-based conversions of anything software-based manipulations of video, uh, and move as much as you can to hardware. Again, something that's radically changed since our 2016 talk is the format ob observation. And you saw in that list of, uh, of six questions earlier that I asked you to consider uh, your format of observation um, uh, as a facet of the, of the facility design. In 2016, I talked about this monitor bank at the rear of the observation room. Uh, the area of the back, you're sort of, you know, the games user researchers will be at the back behind. You're looking at the backs of those monitors now, uh, of the 12 monitors. Uh, but as I mentioned already, um, th it was clear relatively quickly um, after, you know, a year and a, a couple of thousand people through the labs that there was not the right answer for a few reasons. Firstly, this bank of monitors uh, became a, a, a physical barrier, a prohibitive physical barrier between the people trying to work in the room, which when you, when you look at it, you're like, yeah, uh, obviously, but you know, to be fair, like, we, we, I didn't think it was going to be as big of a problem as it was. Um, and it, it just reduced the amount of social interaction that was taking space in the observation room. We've made all this work into putting the observation room to be soundproofed and quiet and co-working and, and you know, absolutely acoustically isolated only to put a bunch of TVs between us and the people we wanted to speak to. How stupid. And so it, we've completely changed this observation format for the subsequent labs uh, and a radical improvement in the quality uh, of the work since. Uh, watching the, this, this, this signal called the multi-view technical term, if you want to Google it later, um, it was how the researchers actually preferred to, to observe the playtest scene focus. So this uh, is a, was, the, the previous lab, a, a sort of 110-inch projection of 12 players at once, um, which the researchers were sat probably 10 or 12 feet from, uh, and, and it's, you know, it was nicely mounted on the top of the wall. And actually, the, the researchers much preferred watching that large-scale projection than this bank of monitors in front of them. Uh, and so that is what we leaned into for the subsequent facilities, is uh, letting the researchers use this large multi-view. And here's what we have in 2022. 
uh, now we're sitting, we're looking the exact opposite way from the previous photo, which is to say we're looking from the back of the room forward. What you can see here is a, a table on the podium uh, with a, a monitor that can change to see any of the signals in the office, including in this case the multi-view with 12 players on. And then s probably eight feet further on uh, is a bank of four 65-inch televisions mounted to the wall. The top two have 12 players each for a total of 24. That's the number of booths in the large lab. And on the bottom two is uh, any signal, for any one of those players can be brought down to say, oh, uh, so in, in an observation format when the researchers uh, and developing teams are uh, observing the playtest with us, they'll say, hey, look, player five is doing something interesting. And a push of a button on the iPad brings that player down into full screen for mutual discussion. Now, a mutual discussion unhindered by a bank of uh, monitors in front of us. Tech has been catching up to help us deliver this. Right? I don't know that this was economically feasible in 2016. For the prevalence of 4K televisions, 4K monitors, the cheapness and availability of them, and 4K television, which has allowed us to buy the equipment that those television studios are using, has caught way, caught way up in the last few years. So, you know, I don't feel too bad about not doing this the first time around. Okay, a few more quick fire tips, if I may. The nature of wanting to duplicate and extract video and audio signals from consumer devices, like the desire to not just plug it straight into a telly, but to somehow, uh, like you would if you were playing at home, but to somehow extract it and duplicate it and composite it and do crazy things with the video, uh, means that you're going to need a bunch of converter boxes doing stuff. Uh, complex looms of cables get trodden on. They get disassembled, lost, kicked, uh, broken. And to combat this, I'm, I've made up what we've called the sofa trays. Uh, these are Velcro-covered kitchen trays. They, uh, and the bottoms of all of the converter boxes are also covered in the uh, opposing Velcro strips. Uh, and so it quickly allows you to assemble, for example, if we're testing on an Android phone or, or an iPhone, let's say, that no longer has a headphone jack, uh, then we can quickly assemble a suite of equipment that lets us extract audio from the HDMI source, make, put it into a pair of headphones, split that signal, uh, and so forth that add a lot more versatility. So this suite of boxes is glued nicely using Velcro to the back of these kitchen trays. And the reason they're called sofa trays is because they just go straight under the sofa that the player is sitting on. So it's actually under their bum the whole time. Super convenient, maybe a minor pro tip, but this has added a great deal of stability uh, and it reduces equipment loss um, as a result. A few more quality of life additions. Uh, we added, with these second labs, second and third labs, what I've called return video cables. Usually what we're trying to do is get video out of the lab, right? Get it from what the player's doing out into our observation facilities. But in this case, we've added cables that send it from the compositing and observation facilities back into the labs for viewing on a television in there. Why the hell would you do that? Firstly, it allows the room to be uh, utilized as a mini observation room because you can send back your composited signals into the, uh, into the play space and suddenly you've got an observation room if you need it. That's cool, just added lots of versatility. Uh, and second, it means it's really easy to adjust the cameras in the room because you can send back the feed from the cameras to the television in the room. And oh my goodness, it's so much easier to just to be able to see uh, and adjust the camera in real time uh, rather than you know, having some sort of running between two different rooms type setup. Uh, so yeah, super convenient. Uh, two more quick ones. Again, added, uh, we added a second CCTV loop. So there's naturally the CCTV pr pr uh, protecting our whole facility, but I doubled everything up in some key areas and added that into our AV solution. That allows the researchers in the observation room, if they're so inclined, to bring up a video of the waiting room, which radically improves your awareness of the facility, the flow of playtesters through the lab, uh, and the security of the space as well. Um, just a super convenient quality of life inclusion that unless you think about it in advance, you, you're never going to justify retrofitting. And lastly, uh, quality of life piece. I, at the bottom here, I commissioned these massive termination switches for all the power in the large lab. As soon as you have to go and press 24 power buttons on anything, it quickly becomes tiresome. Uh, and so these enormous, like I wanted big Frankenstein switches, you know, like 
it would have been really satisfying. I had to settle for these stupid twisty ones, but they make life so much easier to just go and choo choo choo, end of day, break down, super convenient, a little bit safer, and saves the planet. Hooray. Um, all right. OK, I'm running a little over time, so I'm going to do this a little faster. Uh, the design of our space has a profound implication on the potential for communicable disease. I regret that we have to talk about this, but here we are all wearing masks, and so let's, let's, just, uh, let's just grab it and get on with it. These facilities I've talked about were designed in 2017 and 2019, respectively, and so were never designed with COVID precautions in mind. They've been retrofitted, and luckily enough, we made some good, decent design choices, circumstantial design choices. Mostly we're just having a nice office with lots of windows that has made uh, the subsequent reopening of the labs in late 2022 uh, a lot easier than it might have been otherwise. I'll quickly cover some of the adaptations and considerations that might influence your own lab design in the light of uh, post-pandemic. In short, you're going to need more room for stuff. Uh, for example, this is a UVC uh, decontamination cabinet, it r quickly removes surface uh, bacteria and viruses from hard surfaces and so can quickly be used to decontaminate, for example, keyboards and mice. And it's just massive. It's like the size of a large fridge. And so bear in mind this kind of stuff in your layout. You're also going to have a great deal more equipment, uh, presumably, uh, especially if you're doubling up on everything by design. You're going to have 20, 48 of everything instead of 24. As I saw on the slide prior, when I was talking about the relative sizes of all the rooms, the waiting room was already the smallest of the rooms per person, so to speak. Uh, and so I might propose that that, in your case as well, might be the room to focus on in terms of making sure there's enough space to accommodate uh, large groups of people. It probably also has the largest thoroughfare, uh, again, uh, a, a relative risk. Um, There are design accommodations for reducing uh, close proximity interactions. For example, uh, voice of, so called voice of God, where you can speak directly into the participants' ears uh, during a large lab playtest as opposed to having to approach them physically, uh, is an AV consideration you may, I would propose you might be more inclined to use, be that software or hardware, uh, more inclined to, and take that same mindset of reducing potential uh, physical interaction with the participants and consider how your uh, facility could accommodate that. Uh, and lastly, uh, just yeah, the volume of cleaning. Managing 24 booths worth of dirty, so to speak, dirty equipment uh, just needs a lot of space, and it you know, needs space for, for, for people to, to clean them off or to, to store it whilst they're uh, store it safely whilst they're being awaiting cleaning in those uh, in the UVC cabinet. Okay, a whirlwind tour through the facilities uh, that we've built in the last few years. I hope useful, if slightly unusual, takeaways uh, for future lab design in each of your cases. I've left a little bit of time for questions and I would be delighted to take them. Thanks. Let's do it. I got two. Please. Yes. Oh, uh, Emma Vario asked about this in the Discord too. So yeah, two for one. Go. Cool. <coughs> Your last are off. Excuse me. Quite right. <coughs> Your labs are off steer. Okay. We do the same thing. Mm -hmm. By design. Yes. So uh, there's a, sp a sliding scale here, right, between being uh, excessively clinical and creepy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, on, on here, shall we say, and over on this side, like un unbelievably excitement inducing, can't get the children off of the walls because, oh my God, it's so exciting. It's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And so I'm, I'm strongly inclined to be more on the slightly ever so too uh, underwhelming side of things. I think that also affects the quality of the data that we're generating, right? If we have to walk past all of your BAFTAs that you've won, and uh, you know, a, a row of six foot tall uh, plastic Batman figures doing, doing Batman things, then that's very likely to have a, a, a naturally a biasing impact. We are, we are afforded the luxury of being unaffiliated with any particular studio or intellectual property, and we have our own space. So we'll, we'll do whatever the hell we want, and that means uh, keeping things relatively uh, calm and unbiasing.
but, but, not, but just enough to not appear clinical and weird and unprofessional. I think there's like a weird unprofessionality to, to being excessively sparse. And the other question uh, is an unfortunate one. Okay. Uh, you may not have to deal with, but I'm going to ask anyway. Okay. So in the U.S., yes. we have a gun problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, que the question for the tape, and I'm sorry I didn't repeat the first one about decor, was do I have any advice for the management of unintended uh, people bringing firearms into the facility or the, the, the prospect of that? Yeah. Um, I am reluctant to comment because I have simply no experience. Okay. With regret, I'd love to have some advice, I don't. I don't. It's, not something, it, it's not something that is a, uh, a prominent issue in the countries where our facilities are located. Um, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I can't, yeah. but I'm certain that I have heard this discussed prior, and so I don't know, let's, let's meet up after and, and have a chat. It would be nice to know um, if the, and, and share out any advice. Oh my goodness, there's so many hands. Um, I'm not going to go left to right. I think you've been waiting the longest. Go ahead. Seth, thank you so much. Pleasure. Sure. Yep. Okay, for the tape, how should, philosophically, how should we deal with playtesters um, asking to bring in their own equipment for wi uh, over which they are very familiar uh, in order to make it quite feel like home? Um, okay, for clarity, this happens. I don't. Maybe we have different experiences here. I'm pleased to hear it. Uh, this is not a request I don't believe we've ever fielded outside of the context of accessibility testing. And so, and so I'll try and separate those contexts. My intuition is that where it is based on personal preference, uh, you know what, actually this is a straight up, this is a much easier answer. No, because those devices are insecure. Straight up. That wouldn't pass. Sorry, yeah, that should have been the first answer. InfoSec says no. The, uh, the accessibility piece, I think, is a different question, right? right? That's, that's an accommodation with regards to an individual's capabilities. And we, you know, whether or not you're bringing individuals into the lab, ideally we'd be going uh, out into the wild to see those folks set up. I think the, the, that question answers itself. Um, so, yeah, but the first one is easy. No, InfoSec. Uh, I'm not bringing unsolicited USB devices into the facility, absolutely under no circumstances. And for clarity, we don't allow any electronic devices into the large lab. That's what those lockers uh, and the constant observation are for. Go ahead. I do have a question. Uh, you said that you have massive cell switches to be able to shut down everything at once. Yes. Do you have any fears of damaging equipment? Uh, do we have fears of damaging equipment due to master kill switches? Um, they, the... No, because we've d bought dedicated hardware boxes for everything, which are designed to be single master switched off. So with the exception of the PCs, which naturally should not be killed at the wall, uh, we are inclined to reduce the number of software solutions that need to run on PCs. And so everything's just a box that is designed to be killed uh, from master power. And so, no. And a, for Clara, I don't know if I'd be able to tell you. We've never had a box fail, as far as I'm aware, despite that being our standard operating procedure. So. PCs, no, we're not killing those at the wall, no. No, 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 no. Uh, no. As convenient as that would be just to, just to back out of the room and switch everything off with one big button. Uh, go ahead. When uh, designing your lab space, in your experience, is there, are there any concerns of latency with uh, where you want to position your observation room? Is that, could those be a uh, hindrance to play test observations out there? Uh, so... Thank you for the question. It was, uh, do we have considerations to latency between the playtester's experience and the observation room? Is that right? Uh, so one of the advantages of the SDI uh, ecosystem is that it's low latency by design. And a lot of the equipment, and you can do your own research on this too, is, as I say, uh, designed for live television. And so it is benefits from both low latency, low f which is to say low frame loss, um, and also synchronicity amongst devices plugged into it. Now, we don't use a lot of that stuff because we don't have professional grade video cameras on the other end, we've got converters and PCs, uh, but the advantage of this professional, these professional boxes is that they are by design, they are designed for high pressure live TV environments. Um, and so they often have failover power, for example. 
you can plug in two power cables in the back, because if one goes bang, it, it switches seamlessly to the other. There is, a l there is redundancy built in. Again, another reason, I think, to use uh, hardware boxes, almost regardless of cost, over uh, software solutions. But latency in general, uh, absolutely, you know, that's why we should have the highest possible NPCs on the player side, uh, and it should, the AV system by design should not interfere with the playtester's experience. And everything should be downstream in an ideal world of what the playtester sees. I, th I think it, 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 we've proven it's possible to do that. Okay. Uh, was anyone waiting longer? Go on, Deborah. <laughs> Hello. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if this would impact the way you design the observation room because you guys use individual observation instruments and shared functions with the sighted UR preference for the non shared. Very interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. If I may, uh the question is about the use of the ThinkAloud protocol and whether or not our facilities have been designed with that in mind or if we'd made accommodations um if that were to be the case. I uh, will refer back to the slide I gave in 2016, the big blue one with all the question marks on, about that your design for the AV solution and to some extent the layout of the facility should be downstream of the research that you run, which is to say not least platforms, etc., as I as might be uh, sort of for the first flush, but the methodology that you're using. Um, although this isn't a talk about methods, I shall probably declare myself as not a fan of the Think Aloud protocol in general. Uh, you come and see me afterwards if you want to have a fight about that. Um, uh, but I, I, we have used the Think Aloud protocol in those facilities upon occasion. And were there any tech considerations thereof? Um, we've used so sound, video and sound. Uh, the play, the, what the player sees doesn't make too much difference. That's largely the same. The difference between video is the uh, field of view of the cameras and the location of the cameras has twice as many people too to capture. Uh, so the versatility in the camera locations is paramount. If you've got a a PT, what's so called PTZ camera that ha is, a, let's say, a remote control camera, that's a very expensive but very versatile solution. We choose to do, use inexpensive uh, CCTV cameras, uh, bullet cameras, that can be very easily moved around uh, the, the facility. There's also, if you're doing it on a PC, of course, you've got a very unobtrusive webcam on the screen that c can easily be uh, ignored. So choosing slightly larger field of view, changing the way the OBS is laid out so you can have a, a composite that's custom for the playtest you're running. Um, but arrogantly, I, even if we were to position ourselves you know, to pivot full to think aloud, this solution is v versatile enough that that would not be uh, a problem. Does the, I'm just thinking in terms of the shared location. Oh, sorry, yes, the shared location, that's what you said. Think aloud oftentimes results in more conversation back and forth than there's an attentiveness. Hmm, okay. Um, not a problem we've had so far. I could appreciate uh, I could appreciate it could be a challenge. Perhaps we might regret not, not having our big bank of monitors to set, set up the conversation, uh, to split the conversation between the back and the front of the room. Um, not, a prob not a problem we've found. I'd love to examine the differences that, uh, that we, we have in our process that leads to that. But because Think Aloud is a relatively minor am amount of the work that we do, it's perhaps simply through inexperience in that front, I suspect. Um, I'm trying to remember who had their hand up. Hey. Oh, are we done? OK. No worries. I'm, uh, we're on a hard stop. Thanks for all your lovely questions. Uh, it's been great. Come and see me outside. I'll, I'll answer some more. <laughs>